In this video, we're going to look at the details of heteroscedasticity, which we talked about a little bit earlier as one of the assumptions of the Gauss-Markov theorem. And here I have a quote from Studenman's Econometrics book, Chapter 10. And feel free to pause the video and read this quote. But basically what Studenman is saying here is that if you are trying to predict or your dependent variable is, say, heights, then it doesn't really make sense that that additive error term, that uh, common sized error that will be added or subtracted to our predictions uh, to get the actual values, doesn't make sense that those all come from the same distribution many times. A common example is when your dependent variable is income. It's pretty easy to predict incomes of people with low amounts of education and experience. Most people who are just starting out in the world with say a high school degree are all going to make somewhere in the range between say ten thousand and twenty thousand dollars to start. And so a, that additive error term is going to come from a pretty narrow distribution but if you're also in the same regression trying to predict the salaries of CEOs and people with MBAs, then it doesn't make sense that that distribution is also going to be very narrow, very tight distribution for those error terms, because it'll be easy to see two CEOs with the same basic qualifications, educational background, and experience, where one CEO makes thirty or a hundred thousand dollars more than another. And so homoscedasticity is not a, a reasonable assumption in most cases, but we still assume, okay, well let's just see if we have had a homoscedasticity, and if not, we have to figure out ways to fix it. So basically homoscedasticity, the most brief way to explain it is that we are assuming that the variance of the error term or the standard deviation, common size of the error term, is the same for all observations. If you have heteroscedasticity, what you're saying is that the variance of the error terms is not the same for different types of people or different types of observations. And so this is a very key thing, very important that you get this uh, idea right here, that if the variance of the error terms are not the same for all observations, then it follows that we can probably determine that by trying to see is the variance of the error term a function of the explanatory variables. So if it's true that people with more education and more experience uh, and um, higher levels of responsibility, if it's true that the variance of those error terms is a lot larger, than for people with low amounts of education, then we ought to be able to determine that by seeing if there's a relationship between the size of the error term and some of our explanatory variables. And this is the most common way that we try to find heteroscedasticity, is to try to discover those relationships. So um, one other note uh, that's, that's kind of interesting, sometimes if you are doing a regression where your observations are states or counties or regions, uh, those are your units of observation, heteroscedasticity can be caused by the fact that those regions have different sizes, different numbers of people being aggregated. The idea here being that um, if you are aggregating more observations from some regions than others, in those regions with more observations, you're going to get a more accurate reading of what the value of the dependent variable is. And so that's something that you'll, you'll see addressed in, in some research. Now, it's also important to know, now we know what heteroscedasticity basically is, what's the problem? Well, heteroscedasticity doesn't bias your coefficients. And so that's a good thing. If you have different variances for different observations, then that's the slope coefficients that you get out of your regression. There's nothing wrong with them. They're fine. But the problem is that heteroscedasticity will bias our standard errors. Now think, why, why would we care about whether our standard errors are wrong? 
Well, because anytime you go to do hypothesis testing, remember we got we have to calculate t statistics, and t statistics are the ratio of our estimate on the top. And there's nothing wrong with our estimate if we have heteroscedasticity, but it's the bottom part, that standard error that we're dividing by, that is wrong if you have heteroscedasticity. And so it doesn't make your estimates wrong, it just makes all of your hypothesis tests wrong when you go to try to test to see if a variable is statistically significant. And so when you do a regression in SPSS, SAS, or R, I use R in my class, what is going to happen is the standard errors that your statistics program reports are going to be wrong. Those standard errors might be too high and they might be too low. Most often what I see is that the standard errors that you see uh, reported from a statistics program are actually smaller than the real standard errors. Now let's see what consequences that's going to have. So here's the big problem that t is equal to our estimate minus what we think the null hypothesis value is and, and normally for most people that's going to be zero so it's just the estimate divided by the standard error and since commonly this is not always the case but commonly what heteroscedasticity will do is lower that standard error. It doesn't really make it lower. It makes you think that it's lower. That's an important thing that I need to keep mentioning. And so when your standard error looks like it's artificially lowered, but it's not really lower, but you think it is, then your absolute value of your t stat is artificially going to be pumped up, which is going to make your p value artificially look much smaller. And when your p value is you're fooled into thinking your p-value is low, you're going to be saying, wow, look, I have a lot of variables that are statistically significant, when really they shouldn't be. So it's going to induce you many times to make a type 1 error. You're going to reject null hypotheses when you shouldn't, because you think the standard error is low, when it really isn't. And so other times, though, there are other cases where the standard error will be artificially it'll make you think it's too high and so in any case it's going to lead you to make the wrong decisions so um, when your t-stats and your p-values are wrong um, you're going to be making type 1 errors you shouldn't a lot of times but sometimes you're going to be making type 2 errors that you shouldn't if you can fix this heteroscedasticity and so how do we test for heteroscedasticity? Now we've been doing this already just by looking at some graphs. And so um, normally the null hypothesis you want to start with is we have homoscedasticity. And you're looking for any evidence that convinces you otherwise that we have heteroscedasticity. And so we've been doing residual plots where we plot the residuals against the um, predicted values of the dependent variable. And we look to see if there's a different variance, if the points are more scattered for some types of ob observations than others. And so in R, what we've been doing is just plot the regression. Uh, sometimes people will also plot the residuals on the y-axis and look at each explanatory variable one at a time to see if they can find a relationship uh, of heter or any indication of heteroscedasticity. And so you can make a plot like that in the R statistics program by doing plot and type in your explanatory variable you want to look at, comma, residuals, and then the name of your regression in parentheses. And you can do that with some of your explanatory variables that you think might be related to your heteroscedasticity. Now, if you can find a variable that's related to your heteroscedasticity, you can actually use that to fix the heteroscedasticity, which we'll look at probably in another video. But let me get into briefly uh, one of the most common tests of heteroscedasticity, and that's going to finish our time for this lecture, and we're going to come back with another one is the Bruce Pagan test. Now there are two common tests. One's called the Bruce Pagan test and one is the White test. But they're basically the same kind of thing. The Bruce Pagan test asks the question, is the variance of the error terms related to the explanatory variables? Well, what's a variance of an error term? Well, if you take the, the residual and you square it, 
and you were to add them all up, the sum of the squared residuals, that sort of gives you an idea of the variance of those error terms. Now, of course, you'd want to divide them by n minus 1 or n minus k minus 1, but the residual squared is what we're thinking of as being the residuals, so that's the size of the error term. Is that related to the explan other explanatory variables? So we can run a regression, which most people will call an auxiliary regression because it's not the regression we're really interested in, but we're running this regression as a diagnostic test to see is the size of the residual, the squared residual, can it be explained by all of the explanatory variables? And if it can, then you know that the, uh, there's heteroscedasticity because the variance is not constant. And so the bruch pagan test runs that regression and basically looks at the R squared and asks, can we explain a lot of the variation in the variance with our variables?